My name is Kapu Dras. I'm an assistant professor and a resident at Duke University. I, I thought I'd begin by telling you a bit of a story about a patient that I took care of recently. For the sake of maintaining her confidentiality, we'll call her CJ. So CJ was a brilliant young lady who'd graduated as valedictorian of her high school class and had gone off to college full with the hope that she would change the world. Within a semester, she started having problems concentrating. And soon, she started believing that she was getting messages from the TV to kill herself or to kill other people. Her family brought her home, and within months, she had tried to commit suicide. And that's when I met her on the ward. When she arrived, it was clear that she was hearing things that weren't really there. She was seeing things that weren't there. She was getting messages to harm herself and to harm other people. And her, her symptoms that we saw fit into this category of diagnoses that we would call schizophrenia. So we started her on an antidepressant, or excuse me, an antipsychotic. O over the course of, of, of several weeks, she went from being critically ill to severely ill. See, we, while her symptoms, her seeing things that weren't there had gotten slightly better, she was no longer having thoughts of killing herself. What was clear was that the valid Victorian that her parents had sent off to college wasn't gonna be restored. Definitely not in the short term. So I, I took the parents and, and I sat them down and I began to try to explain this diagnosis of schizophrenia. And when I mentioned the word, their faces dropped. They stopped and they said, Doc, doctor, can you pick another diagnosis? They, they pleaded with me to diagnose their 21-year-old daughter with, with early onset Alzheimer's. They said, could you diagnose her with, with depression? Could you pick something else? Could you pick a neurological disorder? Maybe something and say, it's a neurological disorder we haven't discovered yet. So the conversation went on, and, and as we talked, it became clear to me that they just could not conceptualize the full range of this disorder. They looked at me, and, and they, they didn't understand. They said, doctor, I mean, don't you understand what you're doing to her? Don't you understand the stigma that she's going to have? Don't you understand the shame that's going to go along with this and follow her throughout the course of her life? And so as we went back and forth, at the end of the hour, I did something I normally don't do. I explained to them that a year ago, I was sitting in their exact same seat. See, a close family friend of ours had gone off to a pre-med program at Harvard, and he started having thoughts of hurting himself. He started seeing things and hearing things that weren't there, and it ended up in my psychiatric unit in Durham, North Carolina. And at that moment, I could tell that they got it. See, but what I didn't tell them was that my understanding of neuropsychiatric illness was far more intimate than that. Of one of my parents' siblings, three out of the four of them has depression, schizophrenia, or bipolar disorder. I didn't tell them about my time in graduate school as we had to commit one of my aunts. I didn't tell them about when my uncle disappeared and we found him in another continent in an alleyway hallucinating. Once I learned about psychiatric genetics in, 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 in graduate school, I didn't explain to them that I, I spent day after day after day worried that one day I myself would wake up hallucinating. And when I hit 30 and I knew that I'd passed that critical window, that fear translated to a fear that one day one of my children or nieces or nephews would be diagnosed with one of these disorders that one in four Americans suffer from annually. So for me, this real challenge of understanding the brain and understanding neuropsychiatric illness is a quest to heal my friends, my family, my colleagues, and our nation. And so this translated into study and wanting to understand the brain. So the brain is an organ that's tiny enough to fit into the palms of both of our hands. It's made up of over 80 billion cells called neurons. And wrapped within these neurons, these 80 billion cells, and their interactions with one another is everything we experience from day to day. It's when we wake up in the morning, when we lean over and kiss our spouse and say good morning. It's when we walk down the hallway and nudge our children to wake up and go to school, as we're walking down the stairs, as we smell the smell of fresh coffee. It's us driving to work, remembering how to get to work, us being able to perform that work when we get there. And all of these experiences are wrapped up in the brain. And, and so the question is, if we know that there's this organ, and we know that neuropsychiatric illness happens when there's changes in this organ, how come we haven't managed to cure these disorders yet? And so I'll give you an illustration that will hopefully explain to you how complex these disorders are. If I was to ask a simple question this morning, how many of you would like a, like a nice glass of a Staglin family vineyard wine? <laughs> the hands would go up. 
And so see, what happened in that moment was my mouth produced these pressure waves. The pressure waves traveled through the ear, the air struck your eardrum. Your eardrum through its kinocilium and its hair cells translated that, that pressure waves into chemical energy. The chemical energy became electrical energy, traveled down your cochlear nerve, went up, hit your superior auditory nucleus, went into your auditory thalamus, went into your auditory cortex. All of a sudden, this was translated into the pitch. The pitch changed, became words for most of you in the right, the left side of your brain. That became associated with this picture of this wine in your frontal cortex and parietal cortex, all of a sudden your motor cortex is released, these signals go down your spinal cord, and your hand goes up, and all of that happens within half a second. So as we're sitting there, so when we begin to talk about this challenge of neuropsychiatric illness and how to treat it, we're talking about changes that occur in your brain at a speed that is so fast that our medicines that we have available can't yet do the trick. So I'm an engineer by background, so I think about these problems through the context of an engineer. And I think the best analogy for what we're dealing with is if we were to, we were to think about this laptop here. So this laptop, we have something going on in the screen. There are these functions. There's, there's, there's PowerPoint going up. And the ability for PowerPoint to show up on the screen and perform its function is due to this little simple box doing a whole lot of things. So there's a hard drive in there that has magnetic, and magnetic storage capacity. There's a central processing unit. There's memory. There's a fan in there. And the ability to have PowerPoint on the screen is due to the integration of all of these features. So much in the same way that Sophia talked about and Phil talked about, our behaviors are coming out of this complex neural network. That is exactly what goes wrong in neuropsychiatric illness. And so my lab studies this as an issue of communication across neural networks. Now, I'm married, so I can give you a great example of this, right? The problems in my home never occur because my wife isn't talking. <laughs> the problems happen because I'm not listening. <laughs> And so while you may have a part of the brain that has the appropriate signal, if that's not being received and processed by a downstream area, you run into this challenge that the network, the home in my case, doesn't work properly. And so what we're seeking to do in this case is to reconnect the network. I'm old enough to remember when we had to make a phone call, we, we'd, we'd find a public pay phone, put about 25 cents in, and make the phone call. And what would happen is if there was a disruption in the landline, there could no longer be communication. Now we have cell phones, and it's this idea that we can go around disruptions in the landline by pooling information from an upstream area, processing it, and then sending it back to the downstream area in an appropriate context. So this is the work that we do in the lab. This is an example of a mouse, and in this case, what we're doing is we plant electrodes into the brains of animals, and we're able to read their brain activity, but their brain activity across an entire network as the animal's behaving. So we see the information in the upstream areas, we see the information in the downstream areas, and we see how the network is supposed to work. Then we're able to take other mice that have genes that have been found to confer risk for illness in human psychiatric patients with human psychiatric illness. So we have a genetic animal model of bipolar disorder, a genetic animal model of schizophrenia or depression, and we say, where does the communication in the network become dysfunctional? So we can find now these changes in the network. And as an engineer, this is a problem that we can fix. This is a problem that we can approach because we're talking about electricity. And as far fetched as this seems, this is something that we do all the time when folks go in the clinic every day. We just typically do it in the capacity of the heart. So you walk in, you get an EKG, they read an electrical pattern, and they say, is the part of the heart that receives the blood, the atria, connected and functioning properly with the part of the heart that sends the blood out, the ventricles? And they can see that on an electrical pattern. And if there is a problem, we can put electrical energy into the heart to cause things to function in context. We call this a pacemaker. So the question is, can we devise and develop pacemakers for neural circuits? So we have now an ability to pull information out of the brain in real time and in context. The question is, can we put information back into the brain? In animals, this is a little bit simpler. So we have many techniques. We can put light energy into the brain. We can put electrical energy into the brain. We can put magnetic energy in the brain. But this possibility is still there for humans. We can put sound energy into the brain through focused ultrasound. We can put electrical energy into the brain. We can put magnetic energy into the brain. And we can read information out of the brain in real time in much of the way that Sophia was talking about. So the question is, can we use these same approaches to transform? Instead of going in and you're having hallucinations and delusions, and we call it schizophrenia, we say you have a network disruption in this part of the brain. This would almost be like us going in the hospital and saying, you have a fever, let's treat fever disorder. When we know a fever can have many, many causes, 
ultimately with depression, with schizophrenia, with bipolar disorder, we're probably talking about thousands of disorders, and we've come up with these names to simplify things for our sake. But the question is, can we apply these same approaches where schizophrenia now becomes a disruption in a part of a network, where depression is a disruption in a different part of the network, and we treat that? So again, as we're moving forward, this is our goal in the lab. It's to de deconstruct these networks and create a framework where we think about neuropsychiatric illness in this context and come up with tools to directly treat that. So I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here in front of you, and I'm grateful for this award as well. This is the work that that's going to go to. For me, this is, as I mentioned, this is something that's very personal for me and for my family. I know that the treatments that we have available, and in talking to CJ's parents, the treatments that we have available just aren't good enough. They're not good enough for our friends. They're not good enough for our colleagues. They're not good enough for our neighbors, our families. They're not good enough for you, and they're not good enough for me either. We have to do better, and that comes out of partnering with all of us here in the room. Each one of us individually is not the solution. I'm an engineer. I barely knew neuroscience before I got there, and I certainly don't know enough to solve this. But this requires collaborations, much that you see here. The bipolar mice, we work with another in investigator. This work comes out of all of us working together, and each of us have a role to play in generating the solutions. You are yourselves part of the solutions. Your support is part of the solutions. You all coming here and being in this place, your communication with your colleagues is part of the solution. You loving and caring for your family members are part of the solution. So I thank you all for the opportunity to be here. I thank you all for the support you've given us as we all move forward. And we'll, I, I certainly look forward to coming back to you one day and reporting that we've been successful in creating these new treatments. Thank you.